coming to this chapter in Zechariah, we've pretty much closed out the series of visions that the Lord had given Zechariah. And remember that, that what these visions did was it kind of led the people in the promises of God. That, that it led the people in reminding them that God is faithful, that the Lord is faithful to keep his promises. And so with great encouragement, there was so much that was spoken in the first six verses, or excuse me, chapters. In the first chapter, there was reality set in. The reality was that the people had kind of slacked off for a period of time in their devotion to the Lord and their commitment as to what they were to do. And so in the way the Lord does it, he reminds the people of their past only to draw light and attention to them potentially making the same mistake. In no way did the Lord reveal this thing to them to condemn them, but to remind them and the Lord at times will shed to light things in our lives that remind us perhaps of things that have maybe separated our devotion to the Lord or in times in which we made decisions that have had you know, consequences to them and the Lord will then point us to these things and then he will say, listen, you could potentially be doing the same thing again. And I thank the Lord for the spirit that convicts our heart and reveals to us that maybe what we're doing or what we're going to say or what we're about to get into could be detrimental to us moving forward. So this was kind of the idea and the picture with the people in Zechariah's day. And remember that all of these visions were to encourage them now to, one, get back to doing what they had committed to do. And that was to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And these visions were great visions. They were reminding the people that even in their failure, God was for them. And even in their captivity, God was for them. And now out of their captivity, God is still for them. And what God promised long before a lot of them because he promised it, he's going to fulfill it. And so there's this remnant that comes out of the captivity that in one sense they're, they're excited. And there's another remnant that, that is excited also, but, but they are fully aware of what brought them into that captivity. Because, and I say that because, you, you know, I'm presenting an idea to you that, yes, there are several, if you will, groups. And, and these groups, these several groups, one was a group that was taken into the captivity that, you know, pretty much lived throughout it. And then the other group was those that were born in the captivity. So these two groups that the Lord had brought out had come into the land and were discouraged by their enemies. So that was another thing that the Lord did in chapters 1 through 6, was the Lord reminded them that, that he will take care of the enemies. So all of these visions kind of encouraged and led to their getting back to the task at hand. Sometimes God has to remind us of our position and who we are in Christ. The Lord was reminding them that, that they were the apple of his eye. And that's what he said. He says, you're the apple of my eye. You, you are the object of my affection. You're, you're the one. And, and this is what he was reminding them about. Sometimes we don't, or, or they didn't feel like they were that, perhaps because of the condemnation of sin. It, kind of like we, when we say things like, you know, I don't feel worthy because I failed so miserably, right? But that's man's perspective. God's perspective is different. Because he is loving and gracious and good, God is able to love even when we've failed so miserably. The problem is, is we don't receive his love. We're expecting 
this judgment and condemnation. But God doesn't condemn. God doesn't judge in the context of kicking us while we're down. What we feel is the result of our sin. So this is what he was expressing with them that, listen, you're the apple of my eye. And I'm going to fulfill what I've set out to do through you. And, and then the encouragement that Zerubbabel would fulfill the work of the Lord. So in these first six chapters, we see that Zechariah historically, to a degree, historically reminding them of what led to their captivity, viewed their past, and then he brought it up to prophetically viewing their future. So viewing their past in the context of, um, you know, their, their uh, disobedience and then brought it up historically what has transpired to now their future prophetically in, into the second coming of Jesus Christ. So he just kind of probed their beginning and their end. And ultimately, this is what all it's leading to. It started here and it will end here. And, and this is why we had a lot to talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ in those first six chapters. And so this is what took place. Now, when we get to chapter 7, the backdrop is probably Ezra chapter 6. And that whole portion is dealing with the second group that has come out of the captivity. The first group came under the leadership of Zerubbabel and the second group now comes under the leadership of Ezra in the book of Ezra, the author. And, and so what we see now is the people now getting back to their work. So what we see is Darius or Darius the king is now confirming Cyrus's decree. Remember it was King Cyrus, who decreed that they could leave the captivity and go and rebuild their temple. But when they got into the land, as we studied, they were discouraged. And for 16 years, they didn't budge. And then we see through this series of visions, the Lord's reminding them, you need to get back to the work that we started. So the comeback, right? And then we see that now in chapter 7, it's been about two years since these eight visions that Zechariah has spoke to the people. Now, we don't have record of this, but I don't believe that, you know, once Zechariah stopped with the visions that he stopped ministering to the people. I believe that Zechariah ministered and encouraged God's people as they got back to rebuilding the temple. It's just that we have record of the visions that the Lord had given him to the people. But from chapter 6 to chapter 7, from the final vision to this chapter here, there's a period of two years. So everything is good. Everything is going good. As a matter of fact, two years after chapter 7, the temple is completed. So they're more than half ways with, with rebuilding the temple. They're almost done. They're a couple of years away from completion. Now remember, so this just goes to show a lot of what we were talking about. We talked a lot about them getting back to rebuilding the temple. So that's what they were doing. So what we can say is they obeyed. And so the Lord now is going to respond to a question that they have. And, and, it, and we could see that with this question that they are coming along. Now, remember that the, the, the premise of the book is the comeback. How do we come back from great loss? How do we come back from bad choices or decisions? How do we come back from great tragedies and trials and sufferings in our lives? Because all these things play a factor in the life of God's people. And these are the excuses that we use to say this is why or this is where I fell off. 
For some people, they fall off because of great tragedy in their life, right? They, they, they fall away. Some fall away because of, um, you know, disobedience, right? And, and then they feel because they've messed up that they, you know, well, forget it then, you know, and, and then they go on this period of time where, you know, they're wrestling with the shame of their disobedience, and the reality here for the people of Zechariah's day, well, we know their history. We've been studying it. It was because they chose idols rather than the Lord God. And they took for granted the presence of the Lord. And sometimes that's what we can do. We can take for granted God's presence. I think every person, um, at least represented this morning in first service here, can say at one point in time, we've taken maybe the church for granted. When, when we could have come to the church and sought the Lord uh, in prayer or, or fellowship, we didn't. Or perhaps prayer meeting or Bible study or just that koinonia, that fellowship, right? And then we go through this season where we're just not going to church. Nobody here's ever been there, right? And you realize that even though I'm in this funk or this rut, man, those days of fellowship with, with the brothers or the sisters, right? Man, those were the good days. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So, you know, what is that a result of? That you've realized you've took for granted what God has given all of this God has given you did you know that this morning 8 a.m. service God gave it to you the, the people sitting in this room around you the Lord blessed you with them serious this is this is God's blessings to us and you know it's it, it, you don't realize what you have until you have lost it. And that can be applied to all areas and facets of our lives, but, but they're past that now, okay? The person on the comeback should be past that now because the door has been opened by the Lord through the prophet Zechariah that, hey, you guys, come on. And, and don't... Bring the baggage from the past. Don't, you're out of the captivity. Don't live as a captive anymore. Free yourself, not because you have the ability to do so, because I say to you, you are free. But the enemy loves to come and say, hey, okay, can I still be a part of your life? And we have to say, like the children of Israel said to the Samaritans that wanted to help them, no, we can't. We cannot walk together. So then God just kind of gets their hearts and reminds them and just says, listen, let's, let's do this work. Let's do it. And so their enemies are subjected Israel's future is declared by the visions that they received. That, these are some points I think we should take note of thus far. The temple now is more than half completed. And the people are moving forward. So it's not a matter of how do I come back? They've, they've already gotten past that. So the Bible says in chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month of Kislev. Well, the fourth year of King Darius is the year 518 B.C. Remember, the temple is rebuilt about 516. So a couple of years now. This was two years after Zechariah's visions. And two more years, the temple will be completed. And this ninth month of Kislev 
Well, well the, the, the time frame is November, December. And some believe that this date is December 4th, 518 B.C. It says that this time came and the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. Well, why did the word of the Lord come to Zechariah? This, this is what I love. Because verse 2 says the people sent. They sent. In other words, they sought the Lord. You see how fresh, how quick, how this seeking and then the Lord answering is happening now. Whereas when they were in their sin, when we studied Israel's history, they cried out to the Lord and they didn't hear from God. Why? Because of their sin. But here, the people now are, are flowing in the direction. They are, they are moving in the direction that God has directed them. And, and though the enemy might want to discourage them and remind them of their past, the Lord is saying, no, let me speak my future to you. And we can now move forward. I titled the message, How Do I Worship? Because this is the question they're going to ask. What is proper? What is not proper? What was the traditions of man? And what is the word of God? Ultimately, we see that for some of us, the title of our chapter is, Obedience is Better Than Fasting. You know, sometimes we think that to serve the Lord has a lot to do with doing, and we quote the passage, right? I believe it's in James where it says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. And you know what we emphasize? Doers. But James is not emphasizing that. He's emphasizing both. He says, don't just be a hearer, but also be a doer. He's not saying one is greater than the other. He's saying do both with the same attention and the same care. If you hear the word of God, it should cause you to obey the word of God. So you do both, not just, well, I'm going to be a doer. No, you have to be both a hearer and a doer. In other words, this is why Peter goes on to say, it's better for you to have not known than to have known and not obeyed. Now he's doing the other. He's saying, listen, you better obey if you hear. James is saying, do both. And do them both effectively. So here's the idea and the picture that I kind of want to bring into this because it's kind of that same dynamic. So the fourth year of King Darius has come to pass. And so we see that things are flowing. I like when things flow. Anybody with me on that? Okay, good. We're awake this morning? Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> when the people sent Sherezer, everybody say Sherezer. Swing. I knew that would wake you up. When the people sent Sherezer with Regum Malek and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets saying, should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? Let's kind of break this apart just a little bit. I want you to circle the word sent in verse 2. When the people sent, notice this, the people are inquiring of the Lord. When the people sent, the word here, sent, in the original language, means to sow or to put forth. You will reap what you sow. That is good and bad, right? right. If you sow good, you're going to reap. Good. If you sow bad, you're going to reap. Bad. So they're sending Putting forth, the idea is they're sowing something here. Their sowing has to do with seeking. They're, you know, to sow doesn't mean you just... Listen, Paul says if you, if you sow sparingly, you will... 
So not only do we sow whatever we sow, we get, but he also says the amount. How much are we putting forth? It would seem here that they really had a true desire to seek the Lord. You know, that's probably one of the greatest things that we lose sight of on our comeback. We focus more on what must I do to get back to where I was when we should really be asking ourselves, is my heart truly seeking the Lord? Because this sowing forth is coming from a broken and contrite spirit? Or is it just, hey, if I could just get back into the physical and mechanical doings of religiosity, then I'm back to where I was. Use me again. Put me back in that place. I can do it. Yes, you can. Come on, Skeletto, you can do it. Anybody can. You could get back in there. You could do it, yes, but... The issue is the heart. That's the focus here. Here we see that, that the people sent Sherezer because this is what was in their heart. And when the people sent Sherezer, and just so you know, the name Sherezer means Prince of Fire. With Rejim, Malek, well, we know that uh, Malek means king. Regime means heap. So the king's heap, if you will. And his men to the house of God. Now, I know that in your Bible it says to the house of God, but the actual translation means from Bethel. So rather than going to, they were actually sent from they couldn't go to the house of God because the temple was not completed. So pay attention to the text. The people came from. Your Bible should have the word to italicized, meaning it's slanted just a little bit because it's not in the original text. It means they came from Bethel. Now, I believe, I don't know, but just a thought. When I looked at this, I says, so they're sending a delegation from Bethel to Jerusalem. Well, that's quite interesting. Because remember that when the northern kingdom was taken captive, in 2 Kings in chapter 17, those in the northern kingdom for years believed that they had their system. This is what led to the downfall of the northern kingdom. The moment the northern kingdom was created, it was created because of their own system. In other words, they says, this is the way we are going to worship the Lord. You know that this is where we make our biggest mistake. That we know God's word, but we say this. Well, I choose to observe and obey God's word this way. Well, the Bible doesn't give us different ways to obey the word of God. It's black and white, literally written in black and white, unless it's the words of Christ, right? But it's the word of God. Now, now let me kind of lay this out to you. There is a tendency to obey the scriptures according to or on your terms. The Bible doesn't give us various interpretations of one passage. Now, we can apply a passage in different contexts, but the text means what it says. That's why context is everything, right? You can take a verse that perhaps Jesus talks about, you know, uh, you know prayer, and we can apply it to various aspects that take place in our lives. We do that with various scriptures. Some passages are talking directly to Israel. They're not in direction to us, but we will apply it to us because it gives context to perhaps a circumstance that we're in, but it doesn't mean that the circumstance is the explanation of that verse. The idea is that 
the context is always what it is. And so what we're finding at times is we can say, well, this is how I choose to obey this word. Well, people have mistakenly and erroneously misinterpreted the scriptures and have derived false teachings. And like, like listen, let me kind of lay it out to you guys in one simple one that the church often, people, laity, often make the mistake. And that is the passage of when it says, when two or three are gathered. And right away, we say things like, well, you know, only a little bit of people showed up to prayer. But you know, the Bible says... When two or three are gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of you. Well, that's not talking about prayer. Newsflash. Most people don't even know what it's talking about. Because you don't need two or three people to pray. You can pray and the Lord will hear you. The issue is not about the amount of people that are there. The issue is of the heart when it comes to prayer. And, and so what we do is we, we apply that. Now, yes, in a sense, when he does say, when two or three are gathered in my name. But that's not even what he's saying either. The whole idea of gathering in his name. You see, the context is agreement, not prayer. And oftentimes, even people that say, well, it's not talking about prayer. Well, then tell me what it's talking about, because half of the time they don't know. It's talking about kicking somebody out of church. That's what it's talking about. Disfellowshipping someone. That's in the Bible. To come to someone and say, you're no longer welcome in this church. And that passage is saying, bring that person in front of the whole congregation and say what their sin is and say they have not repented and tell them to leave. And then you charge the congregation to disfellowship them also. Oh, but not in today's age. The church don't do that. We love like the Corinthians did in 1 Corinthians 5. And allow a man to marry his own mom and be in an incestuous relationship. And say, well, you know, we're going to love it out of him. Because it's all love here. The church just needs to tolerate. Paul says, no. You kick him out. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, will you say, when two or three are gathered in my name? Think about that. That's how powerful the word of God is. Oh, but we don't like that power of God's word, right? It's grace, pastor. Grace, grace, grace. Just love, love, love. The Holy Spirit. The, yes, we get all that, but God's word is power. And it demands our obedience. And it's to never be taken out of context. And the idea there in Matthew 18 is church discipline, is it not? And the whole picture is when two or three are gathered in his name. Why? Because Deuteronomy 19, 5 says on the account, on the account, on the agreement of two or three witnesses, an accusation will be valid or heard. That's why he says that. So when you're dealing with someone and two or three gathered together and it's according to God's word and they say, here's the charge, boop, 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 and you guys agree, this is why he talks about the binding and loosing. But what do we do with that? We come in church and I bind this. You got a cold? I bind that cold right now. Well, he has a cold, she has a cold. Okay, come here so I can bind that one too. Come here. You bind them all together and you throw them out. Then you got a whole bunch of other people coming in with the same thing. No, listen. Binding and loosing has the same idea. When Jesus told the disciples, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That has to do with 
people accepting or rejecting the gospel message. So if you come to someone and you say, you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, yes. Because you've put your faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Because they did, and you said that, heaven hears it and records it. Binding and loosing. If, if, if the person says, no, I reject, I, I don't want to accept God, I don't want to, none of that, I don't want, then you say, because you've rejected Christ, if you continue in your sin, you will go to hell. That's the only time you tell someone that they will go to hell, is if they reject Jesus Christ. And when you say that, whatever's bound on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever's loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's the binding and loosing. Boy, sometimes I'm blown away by how we take the scriptures and make them traditions of men rather than the context of what it says. So, you say, why this? Because this is what they're asking the Lord. How do we worship? How do we worship? The question is, as they sent, listen, guys, they want to sow. What do you want to sow this morning? Ask yourself that question. Think about this. What do you want to sow? Not your heart. You can't sow your heart. Do you want to sow good or do you want to sow bad? Those are the only two things you can sow. What do you want to sow? That should be our desire this morning. And you know what? When we sow, we will reap. But remember what Paul also says about sowing and reaping. He gives one warning in this whole thing. He says, in the law of sowing and reaping, he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You see, sometimes we forget about that too. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. The, the, the point being made in all of this is what we sow should bring God glory. That the fruit is an everlasting fruit because God's in the business of everlasting, right? Everlasting life. <laughs> God's in the business of things that last, not things that don't last. Look at, he goes on to say, when the people sent Sherezer with Rejem Melech and his men to the house, to Bethel, from Bethel to pray before the Lord. So they came from Bethel. You see the word here, pray? It's the Hebrew word, kalah. Chalach, which means to become weak. The idea is a woman in travail. This is how they came before the Lord. They came with a desire to seek, to put forth, to sow, but they came in a state of weakness and humility before the Lord. They came with a desire, how it says here, before the Lord. The Hebrew word for before is the Hebrew word panim. For those of you that are students of the Hebrew language, you know that's a popular term. Panim means the face. Like when the Lord spoke to Moses, face to face, panim, panim, face to face. Panim means the face or face to face, but here's what I like about the word here, panim, rather than the word pana, the root word. There's plurality here. I just love that. Before the Lord. So their desire was to seek the face of God. This was a genuine seeking of the Lord. So a genuine seeking of the Lord gets a genuine answer from the Lord. You ready for this? And they asked the priest who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets saying, here's their question. 
Should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? How many years are we talking? Anybody? How many years? 70 years. 70 years. It's the years that they were in the captivity. This is where they were. They were in the captivity. So what are they saying? Should we practice these fasts that we practiced in the captivity? Now, notice what it's saying here. It's saying the fast as I have done for so many years. In other words, do we keep our traditions? Because remember, the Lord did require a fast. Now, it doesn't mean that the people uh, could not come to a place of fasting. I mean, Esther called the people of God, the Jews, to a time of fasting, right? And, And we see also in the book of Joel, the people were called to a time of fasting that was outside of the number one fast that God required of his people, according to Leviticus chapter 23 in verses 16 through 32. The yearly fast, God required only one. But that doesn't mean that the leaders or the elders of Israel at times didn't place a fast, didn't mean that God didn't recognize it. The whole purpose of fasting is so that the people would draw closer to the Lord. But but here's the thing. God only required one. So technically, how many fasts should you do? One. One. But God's not opposed to you saying, hey, we're going to fast, right? To draw close. Now, that doesn't mean that you're more spiritual than anybody else because you're doing more than than the last person. It's not a matter of how many times you fast. It's a matter of obedience, God only requires us to fast once, Leviticus 23. So then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, now listen to this, guys. Say to all the people of the land and to the priest, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, during those 70 years, did you really fast for me, for me, when you eat And when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words of the Lord, which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowland were inhabited? Here's Zechariah in true rabbinical fashion Answering their question. The Lord has not answered their question yet. He won't do that until chapter 8 in verse 19. But what Zechariah does is rather than give them an answer, he asks them three questions. That's what rabbis do. They ask, they give you a question when you ask a question. Well, answer this question. This is what Jesus did with the Pharisees and the religious leaders and And so this is what he's saying, because what does this do? This draws attention to the question that we're asking. So oftentimes people, you know, say, well, I have a question. I often will respond this way. Why are you asking? Before I even say anything. And because I want to know where it's coming from. Why they ask will then bring me to a place to determine how I'm going to answer. And so if they ask me this question, you know, like, uh, hey, are you going to this certain place today? Well, I want to know why you're asking before I tell you yes or no. Sometimes it could be that maybe they want to go with me. Now, if I can catch that before they say, And I don't want them to go with me. I'll say, I'm already taking somebody with me. Yes, I'll be there. So why you ask? Oh, I just wanted to know. Well, good. Keep me in prayer. God bless you. I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, you've told me that before. (laughs) I probably have. Anyways. No, why are you asking? Because we know that people don't just ask questions to ask. There's usually motives or thoughts behind questions. 
And in the same way that we ask the question as to why you ask, it will dictate how we answer. Some people also ask because the answer will dictate what they do. So here, this is what Zechariah is doing with them. He's, he, he's, he's saying, okay, well, here is the prayer. Your request comes before the Lord. And, and remember, we've already determined in verse 2 that they were praying really with the right motive and the right heart, right? Historically, everything's good up until this point, right? I mean, they're, they're obeying the word of the Lord. They're rebuilding the temple. They're in that place now. They're doing it. Everything that we've read, they've received those visions of the Lord. You know what? They're walking and taking steps of faith and moving forward. What has propelled them to walk forward? Think about it. What has? Nope. It's the reminder. It's the reminder of what God told them. In other words, God was challenging them not to dwell in their past. Your past will hold you down. And what the Lord is saying to them is, listen, what's done is done. We can't change the past. But here's what you can do. Don't try to change the future. The future cannot be changed. It's already been determined by the Lord. Hello, somebody. Hello. So what is he saying? Rest in the promises of God's word. And just do what God's called you to do. It's as simple as that. What took them forward was obedience. Obedience. You know that obedience sometimes is very hard to do. <laughs> okay, I'm talking for me, not for you. It's the truth. How often, you know, when we, when, when, when we say we're obedient to the Lord, we say that out of what we do for God more than, what I mean by that is service, more than obedience to his word. Let me ask you this question. Everybody, listen, please. Let me ask you this question. When the Bible says for us to abstain from all appearances of evil, appearances, it's not even saying from doing, it's saying appearances. Can you honestly say in your heart that every single day you abstain from all appearances of evil? No. Just think about that. That just goes to show where your obedience, you know, gauges. That's what the Bible says to do. There's just certain things that don't look right, sound right. And you might say, well, I'm not doing anything that's sinful, but, but, but perhaps maybe, maybe a lack of faith. That's disobedience in the sight of the Lord. Did you know that? Maybe in the course of a conversation with someone. Maybe you're talking about something that, that what God wants you to do is talk more about faith, but you're talking more about the reality of the circumstance. Well, let's just get real. Well, well faith doesn't work and let's just get real. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And if you focus on let's just get real, then you're just going to be able to explain everything. Whereas when you practice faith, you can't explain it. And when you can't explain it, then you know it's God. Amen? Amen. And sometimes we tread very cautiously and we end up on the wrong side of that passage, don't we? And we need to really start to say, okay, Lord, what are the things that please you? What are the things that honor you? And all the Lord is going to say is, listen, don't worry about jumping through hoops and doing, you know, a couple of Hail Marys and a couple of Our Fathers and you're good to go. That's the traditions of man. What the Lord is saying is today, everybody say today. I, I will, will obey. obey. That's all he's asking. Don't look at yesterday and be like, oh, I really blew it. What is he saying? Ain't nothing you can do about yesterday. And tomorrow's not here, so don't get worked up. The Bible says, don't say I'll see you tomorrow. Relax. Why don't you just focus on obeying today? And then when we get to tomorrow, if the Lord tarries, and his mercies are new every morning, then we say, okay, as your eyes are opened up, you say, today, Lord, I choose to obey your word. I think that's the right heart and attitude to have. I don't know why I went in that route, but either way, 
Here's the question, okay? So they're asking him, do we, do we worship, do we fast as we have for so many years? And this is what the Lord is saying to them. I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the tradition of men. Do we commemorate, do we observe these specific fasts? What fasts are they talking about? Well, listen, if Leviticus 23 says that there's only one fast that the people are to observe throughout the year, on the Day of Atonement, they're to afflict their souls, right? They're to afflict themselves. That's what the Day of Atonement is. They're to fast, they're to pray, they're to seek the Lord. That's the only time the Lord required them to take a fast. Then why are they observing a fast on the, a fast on the fifth and seventh months? As a matter of fact, there was a fast on the fourth month also. And there was a fast also on the tenth month. These four fasts were created by man, not directed by God. So they're asking the Lord, do we follow the traditions of men? And they're asking specific fasts. Well, let me explain it to you. The fast in the captivity that they practiced for 70 years on the 10th month, this fast commemorated the start of the destruction or the siege of Jerusalem by Babylon. Jeremiah 52 in verses 6 and on down. The fast on the fourth month is when the walls of the city of Jerusalem were destroyed, when they were penetrated and the walls came down. Remember, that was significant for that's what the whole book of Nehemiah is about, rebuilding the walls. 2 Kings chapter 25. The fifth fast is when the temple that was destroyed by Babylon was burnt down. So they had a day in fasting in which they would commemorate the temple being burnt, the walls being torn down, Babylon besieging the city of Jerusalem. And the fourth fast was on the seventh month when their governor, Gedaliah, was killed. 2 Kings chapter 25, Jeremiah 41 and so basically what they're asking here, these, these are the fasts, the, the tenth and the fourth and the fifth and the seventh month fasts. So there was four of them a year that they would observe, but God only required them to observe one, Leviticus 23. So here's what they're asking. Now that the temple is going to be done and the temple is going to be here, are we still going to mourn and fast, if you will, on the fifth month, do we commemorate the burning of the temple now that the temple's been rebuilt? And the other question here is the seventh month. The year 586 B.C. in Jeremiah 41, when the governor of Jerusalem was, was assassinated. If now we're back in the land and it's becoming a city again and a people again and the temple's being rebuilt, do we look back do we observe these traditions? What, what purpose do traditions serve? Well, we know that traditions serve the purpose of from one generation to another. We have traditions in families, right? You guys have traditions. But I mean, ultimately, what do those traditions serve? The Bible is not a matter of traditions. The Bible is a matter of God's word. Traditional observance can become religious without a true work of the Spirit of God in our lives. And we can become traditionalists, ceremonialism, and practice traditions and ceremonies, and even our service to the Lord becomes that that is filled with religion and tradition of men. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? I mean, it's like that old story that, that we say about traditions, right? It's, you know, uh, when, when you ask the question as to, you know, uh, the young woman who's, who's I, I forget how it was, you know, they were cooking a ham, you know, and, and, and they cut the sides of the ham, you know, and, and she'd place it inside the, uh, you know, the, the, whatever, the pot or whatever, put it in the oven and, and, and cook it. And so one day the child asked the mom, why do you do that? Well, because my mother did that. 
So the child goes to the grandmother and says, you know, I seen mom cooking the same, you know, ham. And why do you cut the sides? I mean, look at here it is. It's a little ham and it's a big old pot that it's in. And you're putting it in the oven like that to cook. And well, the, because my mother did that. So she goes to her great grandmother and she says, you know, well, I, I seen my mom do this. And, 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 and I asked grandma and now I'm asking you, why did you do it? She says, well, dear, you know, when I first started making these, uh, the pan that I would use was not big enough. I had to cut it each end so I can fit it in there and put it in the oven. Sometimes we don't even know why we're following the traditions. The ends are still good. You're missing out on the whole because you focused on the tradition. And sometimes that's what we do. We put more emphasis on the tradition because this is the way. Now, let me tell you something. Traditions to a degree serve their purpose. The Bible says that we are to hand down the traditions of the apostles, but it's talking about the word of God. Just because your leader or your pastor studies the Bible, I'm blown away by how men parade and boast their traditions. I say this because I've experienced this before. When people want to sound spiritual or religious to me, they always tell me how many times they've read the Bible. I really don't care. I could care less. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me, are you obeying the word of God? Or this is how much, well, listen, that's fine if you read. I, I do what I do, not because somebody taught me that, because I feel I need to. I don't expect anybody else to read or to study as much as, I mean, listen, that, I can't force you to fall in love with God's word. That has to be an act of your heart and your heart alone. You as a person will pursue what you love. And if you love God's word, you're going to find yourself in it all the time, seeking his will and obeying his word. But, but there is that tradition. I got to be up. Well, I don't have to be up. I just wake up at that time. This morning, I thought that I could sleep in a little bit. Only because my Saturdays are usually I turn in early. Well, I went to bed at 11.04 last night. That's late for a Saturday for me. Because I get up at 3.30, 4.30. Right around that time frame is when I wake up. So I figure, well, you know what? Let me just set the alarm for five. Good half hour of sleep. You know, feeling like it. And my eyes are open like at 4.15. Turn the alarm off. Get up. But that's just every day for me. Now, what do I do with that? It's not a tradition. That's just the time I wake up. I take advantage of that opportunity to get in the word of God and to pray. Because at that time, listen, work don't start till 930 in the morning. So I got a good period of time to nobody else is awake. So I might as well pray and seek the Lord, right? I mean, there's my time. So I can't complain and say I don't have time. I got time. Some of you even sitting in this service, you text me at four in the morning. I get a text message every day at 3.30 in the morning. Every day without fail. And sometimes I'm awake to right away respond back to it. It's a devotion sent from a friend to me every day at 3.30 in the morning. But some of you text me at 4.35. Hey, good morning. God bless you, pastor. You know, and that's it. Well, it's not because, well, you know, listen, he's just so devoted to the Lord. I can't sleep past that time. That's all it is. Nothing spiritual, godly. I don't walk on water, relax. Just that's the time I wake up. If it would have been 7 o'clock in the morning, then I would work my schedule around waking up at 7 and reading around if it, you know, whatever time. But, but sometimes people get this idea, well, that's what you have to do in order to be, no, listen, it's not a matter of what we do. It's a matter of anointing. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of God's doing, not ours. Amen? And sometimes traditions can say, well, this is just the way we do things. What does God's word say? Well, it does say in Proverbs 8 and verse 17, I love those who love me and they that seek me early shall find me. So there is something good about giving God the first fruits of your day. 
But that doesn't mean that if you give him the noon or the evening that he's not going to bless you. I mean, at the end of the day, you're still giving the Lord time that you could have been giving to something else. But the Lord is saying, listen, I think the idea is everybody knows the morning is probably the quietest time of the day, right? Before the birds start chirping. That's that good time. I think those are the times that Jesus went and prayed and he retreated. Now, now I say all that to say this, that I also have to be very careful too. And I have to look at that and say, if I were to sleep in till six one day, I have to say to myself, well now, get up and read the word like you would do if you got up at four. Rather than say, oh, the days, it's, it's gone. Traditionally, I should be up at this time. No, listen, it's not the way it works. Traditions serve their purpose, but tradition is the faith of dead men. The word of God is alive. And what we should be obeying is the word of the Lord. So look at how he asks the question. Then the word of the Lord, a host came saying to all the people of the land. So notice the Lord doesn't answer their question. He won't answer it until the next chapter. But look at what he goes on to say. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during the feast, here's the first question. Did you really fast for me? Wow. That, that's a good question. What were you doing it for? Did you really fast for me? And notice the emphasis added, for me. Does your Bible say it twice? Yes, emphasis added. Did you really fast for me? Look at the next question. When you, when you eat and when you drink, listen to this. Do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Did you do it for me or did you do it for yourself? True worship is an act of the heart, guys. Traditions of men not instituted by God are self-word. The heart of the problem is the heart itself. Com com a common reference to the issue of the heart. So the question here is... Did you really do it for me, the Lord is saying? And weren't you doing it for yourself? And the third question that's asked, listen to this. Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed? So their fasts and traditions, rather than becoming times of drawing close to the Lord, became perhaps maybe pity parties. Instead of a time to grow and a time to genuinely seek God. You know what the Lord is calling him out on? He's saying, listen, these were traditions of man. And the question is, listen, the Lord's not rebuking them because of the fast. Because you could call a fast. They're only required to observe one. What the Lord is saying is, not how, but who. What was the condition of your heart? And so he goes on to say, really the question is, what was in your heart? Maybe the question that should have been asked, listen to this guys, maybe the question that should have been asked was, how long do we mourn our past or remember the tragedies of the past? Because remember that this is what the Lord had expressed to them in the first six chapters. This is what brought you to this place. How long do we mourn our past or the tragedies of our past? And so the Lord's asking the question to them. Listen, you guys want to seek from the right heart. But, but let me ask you a question. Let, let's, let's examine your heart. Did you do it for me? Did you do it for yourself? And was it done out of obedience? Was it an act of the heart or was it just something you guys did? Because that's what you do. Like church, do you just come to church to come to church? Or do you come to church because you truly know that you need to draw closer to the Lord? That there's a work that God needs to do in your life. 
Don't make attending church a tradition. Make it a work and an act of the heart. And so this is how we draw close to the Lord. And I love what he says here. Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? In other words, the prophets taught, taught that their religious observance had to come from their hearts in order to worship the Lord, not from the traditions of men. In other words, to worship God in any other way, any other way other than from the heart would have been hypocrisy. Remember what the Lord requires. Notice that he says in verse 7 here, should you not have obeyed. What do you think the Lord is saying right there more than anything? Those traditions, yeah, they commemorated some very sad times in your past. But at the end of the day, it's not recognizing the tragedies of your past. Well, then why did we have these tragedies? Well, because the Bible says in Psalm 119 in verse 67 that sometimes God allows afflictions. Sometimes God allows tragedy. Sometimes God allows these things to bring us back to him. Wow. And so what do we see here? One, we see that God is actively in control of everything that takes place in their lives. And what he's telling them is he's saying, listen, here's the problem. The problem is the heart, not how many times you fast throughout the year. It's obedience to the word. Do you guys even understand what he's doing? He's actually making it easier for them. He's saying, stop with your religious exercise because you're making it hard for yourselves. All I'm saying is obey my word and that's it. You know what he's saying? Listen, if you want to fast, by all means, do what you got to do. But why are you doing it and to whom are you doing it for? Are you doing it because it's a pity party? Oh, woe is us. You know, we are, our city was destroyed and, and the bad people, Babylon, came in and they, and they destroyed our temple. But do you understand why these tragedies happened? These tragedies would have never taken place if disobedience wouldn't have been what was in your heart. So what I'm telling you right now is, yes, we're out of the captivity. The captivity is gone. Can we look to the future, please? You're always worried about Satan bringing up your past. Let me tell you something. I doubt he brings it up. You bring it up. It's always the pity party. Woe is me. This is why I'm not a stronger Christian because, you know, I just really, really blew it, you know? It's, that's not what he's saying here. If he is God and he is the forgiver of sins and he is the one who restores, then you need to trust him for that and you need to walk in restoration and forgiveness of sins and don't practice the things of the past and look ahead to the future because God speaks more about your future than he does your past. Hello, somebody. And this is what he's encouraging them to do. And so this is why 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22 says, obedience is better than, and in the context here, obedience is better than Fasting. Obedience is better than the practice of the traditions of men. Some people get so caught up in traditions, guess what? You know what they're looking for in a church? What they've traditionally experienced in their past in church. Well, I don't go to this church because they don't sing hymns. Well, well what good are the hymns if you're not obeying what those hymns say? Because ultimately, hymns are, are very rich in doctrine and theology. Point being made is sometimes we take the traditions of men and make them greater than the word of God. Can, can I just sum it up in this way that this is what the Lord is walking them through? He's not, he's not chastising them. He's just saying, listen, you guys are at a right place right now. You're, I got your attention now. You're saying, okay, Lord, how, I'm tired of doing things my way. Anybody here can relate? Anybody this morning? Okay, good. Five of us. God bless you guys, man. 
The rest of you guys show us, please. We want to learn. No, listen, it's true. All of us, we could get easily caught up and, 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 and this could be it. This could be it. This is it. This is the Christian life. Traditions? No. It's walking in a relationship with a God who's real, who's alive, and who's actively involved in our lives. This is a good, healthy, mature, loving, gracious conversation of prayer that God is having with his people that have learned from their past and are now walking in the present in the direction of the future. And guess what? They're forgiven. They're encouraged. They're reminded that God is for them. Their enemies have been defeated. And the Lord has spoken more about their future than their past. But they keep bringing up the past. Boy, I'll tell you, sometimes we live in it because we are not ready to get out of it. The Lord is saying, listen, understand that all I want from you is not the explanation of your past because, listen, this is why you got there or how you got there. What I want is obedience better than sacrifice. Psalm chapter 50, verses 8 through 14. Psalm 50, verses 8 through 14. Psalm 51 in verse 16. And Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. And Isaiah 58, verses 1 through 14, and Micah chapter 6, in verses 6 through 8, all speak concerning what? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Look at what he says. This is what the Lord is saying. Here's a call to the fruits of righteousness that demonstrate God's word in someone's life. Look at what he says. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice, show mercy and compassion to everyone, to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. It's often been asked the question to me as if I had this great revelation, right? You know, Pastor David, what's God's will for my life? Oh, okay, wow. You know, I like that because you're giving me a lot of authority. I just want you to know that. You're giving me a whole lot of authority. God's will for your life is to take me out to lunch after third service every Sunday from here on out. And throw a free car wash in once a week. No, listen. God's word reveals to you what his will is for your life. And so many people say, oh, I want to do this for God. I want to do that for God. I, you know, I want to, they, they lay it all out. They're telling God what they want to do. Let me tell you something. You don't dictate and tell God what to do. I, I want you guys to kind of pay attention just a little bit. What is God's will for our lives? Listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Wow. That's part of God's will for your life. Did you know that? To look to the pastor, the leader, the elders, respect them. He's not saying to agree with them. He's saying honor them, respect them, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Notice this, for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted. See, people, some people get upset when we, when, when we warn the unruly, but the Bible says we're supposed to. We're, we're to comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and we're to be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil, not just you, but you make sure people are not doing that to one another. He's talking about the body of Christ. But always pursue what is good. It doesn't say sometimes. It says always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Wow. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So when people come to me and they say, I just want to do God's will, I tell them, you want to know what? Then let's see how far down the list you get in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Start in verse 12. And when you can practice those things... And make those your aim. That is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a? Do both. 
So what is he saying here in verses 9 and 10? He's saying, listen, the traditions were created because of tragedies. So to practice the traditions rather than to repent is to miss the whole point of God's discipline. Your job was to be obedient to the word of God, to obey the word of God. It must come from the heart. Tradition is practicing in a religious event, but failing to have an inter-spiritual, an inner spiritual experience. All you're doing is following the traditions. Well, it's just a religious event. What about the experience? What is he saying here? Show love. Don't just agree with what the word says. Do what the word says. But then he says, here's the reality. But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, and stopped their ears so that they could not hear. He's telling them, this is what happened. The issue is not about do we observe all these four fasts. He's saying, why don't you just obey the word? Because your fathers were told what to do. And what did they do? Look at verse 11. They refused to heed. They shrugged their... You know what shrug the shoulders mean? Like an animal stiffens its muscles so it refuses the yoke that's put on him. He's saying, do not do the actions of your fathers. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law of the words which the Lord of hosts had sent them. Listen to this. By his spirit through the former prophets, thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it happened. Why? Because of the rejection of God's word, they activated the fury of God against them. He goes on to say here, therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed and they would not hear, so they called out and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. Wow, do you hear that? He says, they called out and I would not listen. Because they hardened their hearts. That's what Proverbs chapter 1 in verse 24 through 31 says. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 14. He says, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations in which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them so that no one passed through or returned. For they made the pleasant land desolate. What is he saying here? He answered their request with three questions. Did you really do it for me? Did you do it for yourselves? And was it an act of the heart? Was it obedience? And he's showing them the act of the heart is not following the traditions of man. It's obeying the word of God. Your fathers failed to do so, and it led to their captivity. That's what he's saying in verses 13 and 14. The issue is not should we observe the fast of the burning of the temple. The issue is, are you obeying God's word? Simple as that. I want to do God's will. Well, then do verses 9 and 10, or do 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. It's as simple as that. Obey the word of God. I love how God just simplifies everything for us. Amen? Oh, but the enemy says, oh, no, that's not good enough. That's not, no, 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 no. People are not going to respect you. Oh, now he's making it about you. What did the Lord say? Did you observe these traditions out of self-pity? Or did you really observe these traditions because you wanted to draw close to me? Who cares what others think? Obey my word and watch what I'll do. Disobey and tragedy happens. Obedience is better than sacrifice. <laughs>